lots of interesting people to listen to this evening. It's going to be multiple speakers. We've got Omar Clay starting and then five other speakers. Omar is going to be talking for about a half an hour and everybody else about five minutes. And uh, we've got lots of material to show you. Uh, at the end of every presentation, uh, there will be a question and answer uh, session that I hope that you will engage yourself in. So a uh, couple of other people I, I do want to acknowledge being here, and that's um, Catherine Bohorquez. She's our Vice President of uh, Administrative and Business Services. She's in the back. And um, I'm just going to say Mr. C, he's my department chair. He's also the time, I, I recruited him to do the timekeeping for tonight, so thank you, Philip, for being here. That's this guy right here. <laughs> You're right, sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. No, Speak, no like, put your mouth right No worries. Um, uh, thank you all for being here. It's just lovely to see you. Uh, this event is for you. It is for the students, it's for the public. Uh, it's, it's for all of us to build bridges with one another and uh, uh, build community. As we go forward to uh, fight climate change, it's going to take all of us. So this is just a great opportunity for that. But before I tell you that, I, um, I have some people to thank. Um, uh, so as, as Patty said, uh, I am with 350 Ventura County Climate Hub, and I have to tell you that the, the group has been so supportive and inspirational. It's just been wonderful to work with them. And uh, we did approach Patty, it's been a couple months ago now, uh, to get this thing going, and uh, she's just been wonderful to work with. And so we wanted to thank uh, Ventura College for, for hosting us here. Yay! Thank you. Also, we have some co-sponsors that I'm just really uh, grateful for, and that would be uh, the League of Women Voters. <laughs> and also Citizens for Peaceful Resolutions. So, I, I, I'm just so appreciative uh, for all of your trust and care that we could pull this off, and that means a lot. So thank you very much for that. And then uh, we have CAPS TV. Yes, CAPS TV. Uh, CAPS TV is uh, filming this, so we'll have access to it. Uh, we'll be able to watch it on our local TV, and then we'll have a DVD here for the college so that they can use it in the future. Okay, so uh, we'll be doing the first segment on uh, climate change science for our students, uh, so they'll gr they can have a, a handle on that. And for those of you who are already very familiar with climate science, uh, uh, bear with us, and, and uh, the solutions will be right up. And then following that, Patty is, of course, going to run a very dynamic um, uh, Q&A, and we've got the tabling out there. So build community, love each other. Let's change this and turn things around. Yay! <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, so I would like to introduce Dr. Omar Clay. He earned a PhD in physics and biophysics from UCSD in 2006. He's an associate with the Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation. He studied both nuclear and biological weapons policy and technologies. In, in the course of that work, he realized that environmental and climatic issues are the most urgent and most compelling challenges facing our civilization. And for the past decade, Dr. Clay has been involved in the study of air quality, water quality, and coastal pollution in Baja California Norte as the research director of science for the people. He also teaches environmental science at several universities where he engage, engages with students from around the world. Dr. Clay? Hello, everybody. Thank you for showing up. Wow, what a bunch of great, great faces here. I'm really excited to be a part of this. I'm going to have to speak a little quickly because I'm going to try to present climate science uh, in, in its entirety to you. And there's a lot involved with the how and the what. Oh, my apologies. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'll try that again. Uh, I'm going to try to cover the how, the what, and the why of climate science. And I'm going to do it rather quickly um, in order that I can fit into this allocated time. But hopefully, if there's any questions, you can hit me up after I mean, questions and answers. And so, so let's just kind of start. And before I do, I, I have to address what's an elephant in the room, which is that scientists are, are really 
strongly in consensus about the data that I'm going to show you and about the implications of climate science, but in our public discourse, there's a real discord about climate science. And you might wonder why that is. If scientists are so sure about this stuff, why is it so, so controversial? And unfortunately, what we have, and now I'm a physical scientist, so I can't speak with authority about these subjects, so I'm going to direct you to some social scientists. In particular, here is Robert Brule, who has followed the money from corporations like Exxon and uh, the Koch uh, Foundation to a variety of different think tanks and private organizations who have been involved in you know, undermining the public's understanding about climate science. And, and so I'm just going to give you an example of that with the Heritage Organization. Here's a billboard that they placed in, in Chicago several years ago, which uh, compares those of us that take climate science seriously to a domestic terrorist, the Unabomber. Uh, and they've also apparently sent out a lot of documentation to K through 12 public school teachers about how they should actually not teach climate science. And I only learned about this from, from the, uh, the National Science Teachers uh, Association. So I, I want to make you aware of that. I know here in California, people are a, a little bit more in tune with, with what's actually going on with our climate. But this is a, a significant issue in our public dialogue. It's not the first time we've seen a disinformation campaign uh, that's been funded by powerful uh, organizations like, in this case, the tobacco industry. Naomi Oreskes, a, uh, a sociologist at uh, Harvard, really gets into the details of this. Um, but uh, the tobacco industry effectively staved off regulation on tobacco products by undermining the public's understanding of, of the science of the linkage between the use of those products and the health uh, impacts. And we're seeing a very similar thing with the fossil fuel industry today. So I kind of have to start with that. I'm sorry about that, but uh, I'll get to the science here in a minute, and I'll just mention that right now we have a number of attorney generals from a variety of states that are actively investigating the uh, Exxon and several other fossil fuel industries about the fact that they've misinformed the public because there's been some uh, releases of internal documents. Inside Climate News has, has got documents from Exxon Corporation demonstrating that they knew well about climate science in the late 70s and early 80s and that they have actively chosen to undermine the public's understanding of the subject. So, th so let's get to the real science of the subject. So what are the facts of global warming? Is, is the planet warming? Well, we have a, about 100 years of uh, climate data, and the 10 hottest years on record all occurred in the last 20 years. The four hottest years on record occurred in the last four years. Is the is climate warming? Absolutely. Here's a global surface average temperature measurement over since 1880. And, and here I'm going to show that same data again, but just to give you a sense of what the scientific debate about global warming looks like. Four different independent organizations here, uh, the, the Japanese Meteorological Agency, NOAA, the UK met it, and uh, NOAA, uh, NOAA is the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, in case you didn't know, and then, and then also NASA have uh, published their records. You can see that they're not in complete agreement with one another, but this is what the discord in the scientific community looks like about global warming today. So that one and a half degrees Fahrenheit rise in the last century may not look like much on average, and maybe it isn't. Part of the reason it doesn't seem like much is because there's a real geographical variation in warming on our planet. We're, we've got land masses that already have three or four degrees of uh, increase in temperature in the last century. You'll notice that the sea surface temperatures have not increased as much as, 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 uh, as the land surface temperatures. And you can see here in the brown is, the, is land surface temperature on average, and in blue is sea surface temperature on average. And you might guess why that would be as you warm water. A lot of that heat energy is getting convected into the depths of the ocean. So right now, all of the changes we're seeing on global warming in our terrestrial environment is just a sliver of what's actually going on on our planet. About 90% of the heat energy that the planet's accumulated in the last five or six decades is in our oceans. And that's, uh, that's a real issue. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Um, here's the sea sur surface temperature uh, anomaly. For, uh, and I wanted to point out that there's geographical variations there also. And actually, some regions of the sea are actually cooling. And that's, that's ice melt off of, of Greenland up there. So why is it warming? This is the multi-trillion dollar question, right? Well, 
Climate change is any time there's an imbalance in the amount of energy that the planet receives and the amount of energy the planet re re uh, emits. Remember that any, any object in our universe emits radiation based on how hot it is. And so w when anything changes I this balance, then the climate's either going to warm or cool as it has historically. And one of the things that could happen, for instance, and does happen, is that the sun changes in, in its solar activity. So you see solar activity in the upper left here. And, and the sun is a dynamic entity in its own right. It has a 22-year cycle. And you can see that actually right now, the sun is decreasing slightly in intensity. It's certainly not gl driving global warming on the planet today. On the right-hand side, you can see there's, there's a number of ways that our planet varies. Uh, these are called Milankovitch cycles. The eccentricity of the elliptical orbit of Earth around the sun varies just a little bit on about a 100,000-year time scale. There's variations in the orientation of the axis, the rotational axis of our planet. There's some precession. These things are varying on about a 23,000-year uh, time scale and a 140,000-year time scale. And then in the, in the lower left, you've got the, or, I'm sorry, I've got the side, uh, incorrect, but here in the, you see the greenhouse effect. A lot of the solar energy incident on, on our planet is reflected off of the surface of our atmosphere. Some of it's reflected off of the surface of the planet. And then you can see that energy is trapped also in the atmosphere. And this is this greenhouse effect. I'm sure everybody's heard of the greenhouse effect, but let's be clear about what greenhouse gases are. There are gases in our atmosphere that are transparent to the incoming incident visible solar energy, and then they're opaque to the outgoing thermal emissions of the planet. So they, they absorb and trap heat on the planet. And it's a good thing we have a greenhouse effect. This isn't a bad thing. If we didn't have a greenhouse effect, our planet would probably be about the same temperature as our moon. It's about the same distance from the sun. So th this is an important effect, but as we'll see, it, it can have a problem. So what scientists have done is very carefully measure uh, those climate forcings that I just mentioned. They're called climate forcing factors, along with a whole lot of other factors that I didn't mention. And they put together models, and they compare their models to what we actually see. So here in the black line is the observed surface temperature increase that you've already seen several times now. And then there's a number of models represented here, but models, when they don't include the human activity, cannot account for the warming we see. When we do include, include uh, human activity, we're, we have pretty good agreement between the models and observed temperature increase. And so how is it humans are affecting the climate? Well, I, I'm pretty sure people have a good sense of this. We're enhancing the greenhouse effect. We put more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and that's trapping more heat on the planet. But our models aren't the only reason we know that. There's a whole lot of other physical facts about the way that our planet's warming that makes it clear to scientists in general that it's due to this enhanced greenhouse effect. I'm just going to pull out one of these, and that is stratospheric cooling. The next time you have to en engage somebody who's a climate denialist who thinks that climate scientists are all bought off or something, you might ask them why it is that our upper atmosphere is cooling. The stratosphere, which is about 7 to 35 miles up, is the only part of our planet today that's cooling. And the, and the reason for that is because most of the greenhouse gases are underneath the stratosphere. And so they're trapping heat below the, uh, the stratosphere, and the stratosphere is not getting those thermal emissions that it used to get, and it's cooling. And, this, and of course, the thermal emissions are also not going out to outer space. So how is it that we're enhancing the greenhouse effect? And fossil fuel combustion is, is the primary culprit. Um, when you look at, you know, so here you can see some complete combustion reactions for methane and octane, uh, but with any fossil fuel, when you combust it, you produce CO2, you produce thermal energy, you pr produce water. These are called complete combustion reactions because these, these are uh, uh, written under the uh, assumption that you have an exact ratio between oxygen and fuel molecules. And of course, we never have that in reality, so you get a whole bunch of other pollutants when you uh, burn fossil fuels in our atmosphere. But this is what would happen if you had idealized circumstances, and even then you're going to get CO2 emissions. Since the Industrial Revolution, we have produced gigatons of carbon dioxide. As of now, we produce gigatons of carbon dioxide every single year. And you can see that in this graph. A gigaton is a billion tons. A ton is around 2,000 pounds. And we're talking about a gas. So you're talking about gigatons of a gas. You can imagine what that might mean in terms of the, the amount of gas we're putting into the atmosphere. And you might wonder where it goes. So these are 60 years of direct measurements of the concentration of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. 
and it's gone up in 60 years, it's gone up by about 30%. So that's, that's, we are altering the chemical composition of the global atmosphere and we're doing it rather rapidly. The other thing you can see in this slide is there's this little oscillation. That little, that's a seasonal variation that has to do, it's essentially the signature of our planet breathing. This is the northern forest when they bloom, sucking in carbon dioxide. As most of you will remember probably from high school biology, when plants photosynthesize, they take in solar energy, they take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, they create carbohydrates, animals like ourselves eat them, we metabolize it, we exhale carbon dioxide. And that's the natural carbon cycle. But what's happened is that humans have dug up fossilized carbon and combusted it. And so now we're getting no CO2 emissions and it's driving the CO2 levels in our atmosphere up. The other way that we're creating climate change is that we have removed a lot of plant life from the surface of the planet. So deforestation is another means by which we drive climate change. Uh, this is an interesting graph because it gives you a, a, a sense of what the relative forcing is from <coughs> greenhouse gas, I mean, uh, greenhouse gases from fossil fuel combustion and then the lo lo loss of plant life and other land use changes. So you see in brown land use changes including deforestation and then you see in gray what happens from our fossil fuel emissions. Cement production requires a lot of energy so that also, uh, and it's a fossil fuel combustion um, a process typically and so that's also putting a lot of CO2 in the air. This graph also gives you some sense of where that carbon dioxide is going. In green you can see plants absorbing it. Uh, in the light blue you can see the atmospheric levels of CO2. We already talked about that. And then in dark blue you can see a lot of CO2 gets into the oceans, the global oceans, and we'll talk about that briefly later. So scientists are very clear on this now. We have a, have a natural greenhouse effect and we have this enhanced human greenhouse effect. This slide shows that, but it also shows that those greenhouse gases, it's not just CO2. So what other greenhouse gases are there and, and how important are they? So let's look at that briefly. What, what we have now is we measure the thermal emissions from, from the planet and when we do, we can compare those thermal emissions to what we would expect from another object of the same temperature, which you see here in red. And in, in the blue, you can see the actual measurements and the difference between the two are these greenhouse gases in our atmosphere absorbing them. So we have a very clear sense of what greenhouse gases are doing and which ones are of most importance. So this, this is an attempt by the EPA to, to uh, d demonstrate the relative strength of different greenhouse gases. You can see that carbon dioxide in green is the biggest greenhouse gas uh, forcing term in our climate today. But the others are important too. Methane, nitrous oxide shown in orange and yellow, and then some chlorofluorocarbons in purple and pink. And the reason carbon dioxide is so important is, is largely just because it's in the highest concentrations in our atmosphere today, and we produce more of it than any other, other gas. But uh, these other gases actually on a molecule per molecule basis tend to be much more potent greenhouse gases than CO2. So we really need to con consider controlling all of these gases and the emissions of all of them. And we have here a concentration curves in our atmosphere for all the gases I just showed you. You can see CO2 going up year by year. Unfortunately, nitrous oxide going up year after year. Methane also going up year after year. But what's that in the, uh, with the lower left here? The chlorofluorocarbons, it, they're not increasing in concentration anymore. In the 1990s, they just quit increasing in concentration. You might wonder why. The reason for that is because in the 1980s, the world's leaders, political leaders, took scientists very seriously about the fact that we were destroying our ozone layer by emitting chlorofluorocarbons. They passed the Montreal Protocol in 1987 and we've controlled CFC emissions ever since. And, and, and so this, this, this uh, set of graphs speaks to several things. One, we're changing the composition of our global atmosphere. Two, when we behave appropriately, we can manage our emissions. We can do it. And three, once we do manage our emissions, they, those gases don't go away. These pollutants are going to stay up there for a while. Those chlorofluorocarbons are still in our atmosphere. It's going to take hundreds to thousands of years for some of those to actually purge from the atmospheric system naturally. So <clears throat> we take one more step back and look at a 2,000 years of, of the three primary greenhouse gases. And this really gives you a sense of just how much we've changed our, our atmosphere, the chemical composition of it. And unfortunately, this graph is actually about 12 years old, so all those gases have gone up since then. I've written down the latest values. Since the Industrial Revolution, since about 1900, 
uh, CO2 has in increased in our atmosphere by almost 50 percent, um, methane by almost 200 percent, nitrous oxide by about 20 percent. So <clears throat> we understand, the, you know, the basics of, you know, why the climate's changing, but where are these greenhouse gases coming from exactly? Let's, let's dig into this a little bit so we understand how to control them. First of all, this is an Oxfam estimate, so I can't speak completely to the, the accuracy of it, but the estimate is that of lifestyle greenhouse gas emissions, the, the wealthiest 10 percent of our global population has produced about 50 percent of those emissions, and the poorest 50 percent of our global population has produced just 10 percent. Uh, in terms of national emission profiles, cumulatively, cumulatively the United States has, has, has produced far more CO2 than any other nation in the world. And when we think in terms of how much we each produce per capita, how much CO2 emissions we have on average as Americans or as other uh, members of other nationalities, we see that the Canadians, the Americans, the Australians, uh, people from Saudi Arabia and Qatar are really leading the world in terms of our, our CO2 emissions. Um, but there's been a real change in the national profile of emissions in the last two decades. In the early aughts, China brought on uh, into action a whole bunch of coal-fired power plants. And when they did, you can see that their emission profile leaped dramatically. Coal is the dirtiest fossil fuel, and, and, Ch and China really brought a f quite a few of them online. The other thing you can see in this graph is that the EU and the United States has been slowly decreasing our greenhouse gas emissions for a while. And there's a number of reasons for this. Some of them are simply economic market forces. We are moving to cleaner energies, whether people like it or not. But some of it has to do with various little treaties and clean air acts within, our, uh, within national, uh, national boundaries. So I'm going to delve a little bit deeper into where these gases come from. This is where we can really figure out how we can control them. As far, and I'm going to use the United States as an example, but it generalizes somewhat to the rest of the world. So carbon dioxide, straight up a third of our CO2 emissions comes from electrical power consumption, electrical power use. Well, and why would that be? You might think, oh, I mean, aren't, uh, aren't electrical vehicle, electric vehicles going to save us or something? It really depends on where the electricity comes from. Most of our electrical power generation, uh, in the United States, about 40 percent actually, is coal fire based. Lots of our power plants are combustion based. So even though you're using that electricity at home, you're not producing the CO2 at home, it's being produced elsewhere. Um, you see a 30 percent is 32 uh, percent related to transportation. I'm sure that won't surprise anybody. 15 percent by industry. Let's look at methane. Methane, 38 percent of our fossil fuel emissions are, are I mean, 38 uh, percent of our emissions are directly linked to the fossil fuel industry. When you're, ex you know, doing strip mining to get to coal, whether you're ex uh, pulling gas out of the ground or you're looking for oil, you're often releasing methane in, into the atmosphere. So this is a primary way that we're driving methane in, uh, in, in the atmosphere today. Another third is due to livestock, these concentrated area feeding operations where the beef industry has is, is put together lots of cows. Cows' digestive process creates methane, and then the manure, manure creates methane. This is why uh, vegans and vegetarians have a claim to a more ecologically friendly lifestyle. 18% um, landfills, not, not a particularly big surprise. Methane is a, a stinky gas, and you would know if, if you were at a landfill. Nitrous oxide, 80% of it's from agriculture. This has to do with the fact that fertilizers are nitrogen. Uh, plant fertilizers typically involve nitrogen, and the production and the application of these nitrogen fertilizers has put a lot of nitrogen into our soil, a lot of it into our water, and a lot of it into our atmosphere. Uh, so uh, you see, again, 13 percent uh, of nitrogen oxide is, is due to combustion reactions, and that's because these combustion reactions are occurring in our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is 80 percent nitrogen gas. When you burn things in it, you're going to create some nitrogen oxide and, and, and nitrous oxide, and then you're going to get uh, greenhouse uh, gas emissions. So, okay, we have a good sense of why the climate is changing, how we're doing it. Is it really a problem that the climate is changing? What, what's the problem? Well, there's a variety of ways of trying to break that down. This graph just is saying, look, maybe we'll look at physical effects, we'll look at ecological effects, social effects, and then there's a variety of climate feedbacks, which I'll mention some of them later. So let's look at some of the physical effects. Sea level rise, this is something that coastal communities around the world are already getting familiar with. As the ocean warms, water expands. And as that water expands, the sea level rises. Yes, there's also glacier melt that's driving sea level rise, but it's primarily the temperature increase of the, of the uh, uh, oceans. 
And, and a variety of areas are very vulnerable to sea level rise. This is an attempt by the USGS to, to determine how vulnerable different areas of the US are. But certainly a lot of island countries are in serious jeopardy already. Um, and here in Southern California, the estimate is 30 to 70 percent of our beaches may be completely eroded by 2100 if there isn't significant human intervention, both in erosion control but mostly about climate change first. Extreme temperature and weather events. Unfortunately, this is also something that we're very familiar with in, uh, in Ventura County and in California. Um, as, as the temperature profile shifts, shifts to hotter and hotter weather, we're going to see more warmer weather, okay, but we're also going to see more extreme hot weather. We're going to see more droughts. We're going to see more wildfires, and in fact, we're already seeing that. Wildfire frequency is increasing in, in California. It's increasing across the country, and uh, long wildfire season, fire seasons are increasing around the world. There's, there's a variety of other physical effects, including changes in precipitation. So we've seen precipitation changes already. These can be pretty complex exactly, you know, because the, as the climate changes, uh, heat drives the hydrologic cycle. So some places are going to get drier, some places are going to get wetter. Um, it looks like that the northern hemisphere on average is going to lose a little bit of water. We're going to lose a little precipitation. We're seeing here, this is a 2100 estimate projected by NOAA, and it, it looks very dire for California if there isn't significant intervention in the climate system before this time. As you can see, the whole region gets quite dry. Um, Water scarcity is expected to increase as a result of that. Water scarcity is already a health problem around the world, and it's going to be a bigger problem if we don't do something about the climate. Um, in spite of the fact that we're seeing less average precipitation, there's going to be greater, or there is, this is ob observations now, we're not looking at projections, a greater uh, extreme precipitation events. So we're seeing heavy downpours more often, even though we're seeing less precipitation overall. And so this drives things like flooding and co erosion, and it's also not particularly great for, for uh, feeding crops. Natural disasters. The, the, the science on natural disasters isn't quite as clear. Um, this is from Moody's Investor Service. I believe that they, they draw this data about um, uh, natural disasters from insurance claims. But it's, it's inflation adjusted, and you can see that they're seeing increases in flood uh, landslides, storms, a variety of extreme weather events, a, a similar, uh, similar type of a graph here from The Economist. And then NOAA, what NOAA did was they, they went ahead and just took all the climate and weather related disasters that were worth over a billion dollars and graphed it out. And you can see that, oh, it's increasing. In 2017, we actually saw 15 of these over $1 billion weather or climate related disasters. So this is going to be a real economic impact. And this is one of the things that people often argue is, oh, we, we can't hurt our economy. We're going to hurt our economy if we don't do something sooner rather than later about the climate. How about sea ice and glacier melts? Well, if you, if you ever wanted to see a mountaintop glacier, I encourage you to do it earlier rather than later. It looks like we're, we're losing glacier on every mountaintop that has it. They're melting just straight up acro across the world. Ice loss in both Greenland and Antarctica, there's a couple different graphs here. One of them's looking at square area that's been lost. The other's looking at actual mass loss. It's all decreasing. Arctic sea ice, it's been decreasing for some time now. And, and, and these, these changes have real implications. There's not just habitat loss, but there's also a climate feedback. So I'm going to mention both of these briefly. Habitat loss, we've all seen the polar bear, and it's true, this species may be in real, real jeopardy, but it's not just the polar bear. When you lose sea ice, you lose the algae on the bottom of the sea ice, you lose the zooplankton that feed on that, you, then the carp that feed on the zooplankton, and the seal that feed, feed on the carp, and then the, the polar bear that fed on, fed on the uh, seal. So, so there's a whole ecological cascade, and this is kind of a, the standard story when it comes to ecology. It's one of the reasons we need to be careful about the global ecology. The other thing is this climate feedback loop. Ice, snowpack, glaciers reflect most of the light incident on them. So a lot of that energy just goes right back out to space. It's, it, but when that stuff melts and it, and it leaves bare earth or sea surface, well, those surfaces are going to absorb about 70% of the energy incident on them, which means that it's going to drive global warming. So this is an example of a feedback. It's a climate-induced change that itself drives climate change. And unfortunately, it's just not the only one. There's a whole series of them. I didn't list them all. Uh, ice melt, 
I just mentioned. As the oceans warm, they're going to be able to absorb less heat, so they're not going to be able to mitigate what we see here on land as easily. They're going to absorb, they're going to absorb less CO2, so the CO2 at, uh, in the atmosphere is going to increase more rapidly. That's a positive feedback loop. The melting permafrost. Permafrost is, fr is permanently frozen soil, soil that is frozen all year round. As that melts, the biological and organic processes in the soil start to speed up, and they will produce methane and CO2, which is, again, going to drive global warming, another positive positive feedback loop. This, this is a slide that's really attempting to try to summarize a lot of the different effects that we're going to see uh, as a result of climate change and some of the effects that we're already seeing. Uh, and I, there's several things that I haven't mentioned yet. And uh, so changes in animal migration and life cycles, changes in plant life cycles, damaged coral. So let's start with some of these ecological effects and, 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 and get a little bit of an understanding of them. Ocean acidification is, is an issue that, that hopefully everybody's heard of, but if you haven't, it's a major, major issue. Uh, if you direct your attention to the middle lower graph here, that's sea surface pH. And the sea surface pH has declined for the last 40 years. And the primary reason for that, and it may not make sense at first, is when we increase the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, more carbon dioxide dissolves in the surface water bodies, including our oceans. And when that happens, more carbon dioxide is converted into carbonic acid in the, in the oceans. And that acid, of course, is decreasing pH. The waters are becoming more acidic. So for the, so here's some measurements. This is about uh, 30, 40 years of measurement. You see it in red, again, atmospheric CO2. In green, you see the sea surface, the dissolved carbon dioxide in the ocean. And then in blue, you see the pH of the sea surface decreasing year after year. And, and this is going to you know, really challenge shellfish and other uh, marine organisms that have calcium carbonate uh, exoskeletons because those exoskeletons dissolve in acidic waters. And it's also, uh, unfortunately, going to cause a real problem for coral reef. Coral reef are, are the keystone species of our ocean ecology. They provide habitat for an immense diversity of marine uh, organisms. And unfortunately, the reefs are extremely sensitive to uh, pH and to warming water. And so here, here are some pictures of before and after of the Australian Great, Ra uh, Great Barrier Reef. Here's a, um, some, uh, another image from the same, same survey, but off of American Samoa. You can see a healthy reef here on, the r here on the right. And then in the middle, you can see the bleached reef where this is a stressed reach, the symbiont from the, from the coral has already exited, and then the following year, the reef is dead. And, and this is happening all around the world. This is a, a profound tragedy that I uh, don't even want to think about too much, honestly. Uh, those marine organisms that can actually move are moving, so we're seeing that or organisms like the lobster and the flounder are moving to higher latitude where the water's a little cooler. And that's a common theme in the, w in the ecological response to climate change on land as well, is that w when organisms can move, they're going to move to cooler regimes, whether that's up or it's to towards the poles. And, and that's happening in a variety of ways. Here you see in Europe, birds and butterflies heading north, a whole bunch of species in the United States, species around the world. Th some of these species are going to present particular problems for humanity. For instance, fleas and uh, ticks and uh, mosquitoes, which are, are, are able to carry and transmit pathogens, are going to have expanded ranges. And so human populations that have never encountered the Zika virus or malaria or, or um, dengue fever are going to be seeing things that they've never seen before. <clears throat> and all this negativity about climate change, you got, you got to wonder, isn't something good going to happen with it? And maybe, maybe so. Uh, here, you know, we have one of these before and after shots again. And it, it looks like, well, OK, maybe we lose some of these species, but we're going to have new, new plants and new opportunities for life. The Arctic is greening. And there is some truth to that. Um, when we look at agricultural productivity, and this is a projection again, it looks like most of the world's going to suffer. But if, as long as climate change doesn't you know, increase temperatures over two degrees, there's going to be a, a few areas in the northern latitudes that are actually going to see increased agricultural productivity. It's partly due to precipitation. It's, it's, it's due to longer growing seasons. Um, <clears throat> so, but that's, again, it's, it's, it's within a certain degree of range of, of warming. Uh, when we look at natural habitats, the biomes are shifting northwards, as you can see here. And studies over and over again, it looks like this is tree diversity in the eastern uh, continental US. It looks like the diversity of the organisms in these biomes is going to decrease every time we have these habitat shifts. And 
you know, a biodiversity is kind of the fundamental metric for the health of an ecosystem. So, you know, ecologists have looked at all these different e ecosystems in, in great detail, and unfortunately, it looks like biodiversity is going to be declining everywhere as a result of a changing climate. Uh, animal, uh, and NASA has this, uh, this study here where they've, they've looked at what they expect to happen in, in different uh, biomes around the world, and their estimates are that without serious intervention, we may see 40% of biomes have complete alterations from forest to grassland or grassland to desert um, by 2100. So <clears throat> animal species around the world are really facing several challenges. They're facing temperature extremes, droughts, habitat shifts, storms and flooding, and a variety of other events. And these are exactly the kinds of things that humans are also facing. So, so the issue for us, you know, uh, well, before I get to that, like, my, my, let me remind you that this is all temperature dependent. So some of these changes we're already seeing. We're seeing the glacier loss. We're seeing the loss of coral reef. Some of these changes haven't yet ha occurred, and we still have some opportunity to do something about it. So, so what can be done? And, and what I can say about that is we're organizing, people are organizing on every scale from international governance to state governments to municipalities and uh, lo local organizations and on the household level. And that's why we're here today is to hear this panel really help all of us understand what we can do within Ventura County. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our distinguished panel and thank you for, for your attention. My goodness, he just like crammed two or three weeks of instruction into 30 minutes. So that was pretty amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking some of those terms are familiar to our students in the audience who have already gotten a little bit of that. So um, it might be a reminder. All right, I would like to introduce our next speaker. It's Ventura City Council member Christy Weir. She's been on the City Council since 2003 and is currently on it. During the interim, she's served uh, two years as deputy mayor. She was a mayor for, uh, for one term. She's a member of the city's Economic Development Committee and serves as the chair for the council's Finance Audit and Budget Committee. And, and she's taken an interest um, in leading our, our city toward renewable energy, and she's a board member of the Ventura City Regional uh, Energy Alliance. Um, her recent city council vote for the city to join the Clean Energy Alliance will allow the city to move much re more rapidly towards meeting its goals for the Climate Action Plan, which the city voted to establish in 2017. So, Christy. <laughs> Okay, that presentation gave a good indication of the work we have ahead of us. In Ventura, our goal is to do what we can locally. So we're gonna pres preserve and protect our environment. Next. And here's how we're gonna do it. Um, just recently, we joined what's called now the Clean Power Alliance. It started out being called the um, Los Angeles um, Alliance, but they have included us in Ventura County. So almost all of the cities in Ventura County have now joined, and what it means is next. This new organization will allow you, as consumers, to choose between SCE, Southern Cal California Edison, and what power they offer, and the new organization, and you can choose 100% renewable, 50% renewable, 70% renewable, and save money. The local control means that we are able, communities such as Ventura are able to control what, where the power comes from. And, and hopefully you will all choose renewables when the time comes. One of the things we are known for in Ventura, obviously, is our shoreline, and, and the um, climate change is gonna have a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of things happening on that shoreline. As you can see now, when you walk down there, there's a lot of erosion, and it's because the waves are higher, the tides are higher, the sea level is rising. And what we have done at Surfers Point um, on one part of it is called our managed retreat. Um, where it was falling into the ocean before, obviously, um, we c that was not sustainable. We're not going to put rocks up there over the years to protect the oceans. That's not the sustainable way. The managed retreat, which we have now, next, 
Um, you can see what we did is move all of the man-made, the bike path, the parking back and built a new beach, which is sort of reminiscent of how it used to be before we put those things out too far. And um, it took many years and many millions of dollars, but it has been so successful. It has withstood lots of high storms, high waves, and it is the model that they are using in Washington, D.C. when they're talking to coastal communities about how to withstand um, the impacts of rising sea level. Um, it's one of the few that, that has been done nationwide that's actually working. Next. Part of that project was uh, stormwater. All of our stormwater that washes off from our streets goes into the ocean and it has pollutants. So what we're doing is making sure as much as possible we screen and filter that stormwater before it gets into the ocean. Next. Um, this is the new bike path that was built out there in the managed retreat area. Next. Um, we have been named, uh, got an award for being the number one fleet of city vehicles in the nation. And that is because our fleet is made up of, um, we have 18 hybrids, seven electric cars, three plug-in hybrids, two Kia Souls, and one RAV4 EV. Um, we have saved 23,084 kilograms of greenhouse gas savings just in 2017. <laughs> and as we move forward, our, our police department is even, the picture there is our uh, new police vehicles. They're very tiny and they're very, um, they're, they're very efficient. Next. Uh, one of the programs I'm the proudest of is our urban forest. Uh, we, in our drought, lost a lot of trees. You've seen in lots of parks like Aurora Verde, a lot of our uh, trees have died. What we have done now is, for one thing, um, we're teaching kids how to plant trees. And actually, a couple of weeks from now, we're doing a tree planting on the avenue um, where we're inviting the community to come help plant a lot of street trees. Next. We are able now to plant 500 trees per year in the city of Ventura because we're using recycled water. Our sewage treatment plant, um, we make recycled water there. We're able to truck it um, and put it on all the new trees. We have those green gator bags, which we use. Um, so we're not gonna let the drought uh, prevent us from having a healthy urban forest. So when you see new trees planted, you can rest assured that we are not using potable water, we are using recycled water on keeping those trees alive. Next. <laughs> uh, one of our big missions in Ventura is to educate our public about what they can do for sustainability, which includes recyclables. We have one of the highest rate of recycling in the entire nation here. We educate our, our citizens about using gray water, about collecting water in rain barrels when it does rain, and about permeable surfaces and ocean-friendly gardens. We're trying to encourage people to, to not spend too much water um, on, on lawns, but the uh, drought-tolerant landscaping is really taking off. Next. So I hope you will join us in the city of Ventura in helping to care for our environment and adapting to, and preventing climate change. Thank you. All the more reason I love living in Ventura. Thank you for sharing that, Christy. I appreciate that. Next up is Kimberly Rivers. She's Executive Director for Citizens for Responsible Oil and Gas, also known as Seafrog. It's a Ventura County community-based nonprofit organization. It defends local communities and wild places um, from the adverse effects of oil and gas extraction. Seafrog formed in 2013. Um, after some residents challenged an oil and gas project in their neighborhood and they saw the local county planning department working on behalf of the oil company. Ms. Rivers holds a bachelor's degree of law in law and society from UCSB. She completed the California Naturalist Certification course and currently serves on uh, assembly member Monique Limon's Natural Resources and Environment Advisory Committee. Kimberly? Thank you so much. Wow, what a great packed house. So I am so happy to hear something that Dr. Clay said, that there's still hope, there's things we can do. And one of the things that Seafrog works on 
is advocating here in the county for us to be doing whatever we can to reduce contributions to climate change. So this is a map showing all of the oil and gas wells throughout the county, and the red arrows are showing projects that Seafrog and our partners have challenged, appealed, submitted comments on. I have a question for all of you. Who do you think is the final decision maker about whether or not oil and gas wells get drilled in the county? Think about it. The feds, the state, local. Yes. Yes. So it's our local land use planning department in the county. If there was active oil and gas within city jurisdictions, it would be the city. But it just so happens that in the county, it's all in incorporated lands. So it's your local county land use department and ultimately your board of supervisors, elected officials, that decide. So think about that during the next local election. So how many of you have heard about a general plan? Some of you, not half of you. So the state of California mandates that every municipality have a general plan. It's the land use constitution for where we live. So cities have them and counties have them. And right now, Ventura County is updating their general plan. When it's approved in 2020, it will be in force until 2040. Seafrog and partners have taken this opportunity to ensure that climate action, not just resiliency and adaptation actions, but actual climate action to reduce contributions are incorporated into that land use document. <laughs> Yay! It's a big, it is a big deal. So it's never been part of land use in the county before, right? So for the very first time, that language is going in at the policy level that will affect zoning ordinances. And land use, for most of us general public, we don't think about land use every day, except it does impact your lives every day. It determines where schools go in relationship to ag land, where bike paths go, where gas stations are allowed to be, where dry cleaners are allowed to be, where more houses are built. So it's a huge issue that encompasses lots of topics. And climate change, we think, should be at the top. So stay tuned. Over the next two years, we're advocating for this ongoing. There's going to be public hearings. We're going to need all of you to turn out to make sure and hold your supervisors accountable for taking strong climate action. And so in that vein about what we can do locally, I want to talk about a project that's happening right now. So Ventura County is currently processing an application for 79 new wells on the Oxnard Plain. So the red arrows show where the, nine well, where the 79 wells will go if it's approved. It's taking away ag land. And not only that, it's to extract tar sands using cyclic steam. So tar sands, in terms of what Dr. Clay was talking about with high carbon content, when it's burned, it's some of the dirtiest oil. The process that the oil company would have to use to extract out this peanut butter type substance is called cyclic steam. It's very energy intensive, and it requires major processing. They have to truck in crude oil to mix with the tar sands to be able to put it into the trucks to take it to the refinery. 400 trucks a month are going to come to this site as part of that process. So Seafrog has taken the position of no new tar sands extraction in Ventura County. <laughs> And we've let the county know that should they approve this project, we do plan to file an appeal. And this project is being processed in a, as a ministerial project. So I'm not going to take the time to go into exactly the details of what that means, but basically it means that there's no public notice, no public hearings, and no full review under the California Environmental Quality Act. And that's a county policy decision. They've decided to process this type of project on this type of land use permit as a ministerial action. We submitted a comment letter because we're tracking these projects and we're able to see it come up in a little hidden part of their website. Um, and so we are anticipating an initial approval of the project by the county and we are poised to appeal it. And that's my project. So 
in order to support our work and help bring about local action for change regarding climate change here in Ventura County. Because we have to be part of the global community, right? We can't, we have to do what we can locally so that we join with our neighboring counties and support them and support each other. And I would really ask you to subscribe to our emails at cfrog.org, sign up to volunteer and come to our public hearings so that your local elected officials can see your faces just like I'm seeing you today and know that this is the type of work that you support. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Kimberly. Um, Dan Dietrich is, Jan Dietrich is up next, sorry. She's president of Rincon Vitova Insectaries. It produces and markets beneficial insects for biological pest control. Uh, and that business won the 2016 Global Regenerative Business Prize. She's also director of uh, Dietrich Institute for Applied Insect Ecology. So Jan is deeply concerned with pollution and climate change, and she founded, and because of that, she founded uh, the Venture Chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby in 2013. It's an international grassroots organization with 479 active cha uh, chapters worldwide working to fight climate change. Jan? What a great crowd. Can you hear me? Yeah, so enjoy the art while I talk about carbon pricing policy and drawdown technologies and, uh, and their relationship. So I run that green business. Uh, several years ago, I started feeling lonely and looking around. I mean, this was about seven years ago, and I had my, my arm had been sore patting myself on the back for doing such a wonderful environmental business, right? But then I saw, well, what difference does it make if nobody else is shrinking their footprint? Uh, you know, all the marches are great. I, I was happy when we marched. <laughs> I love the lawsuits. <laughs> you know, we need to sue the government when they, to get the right action sometimes. The education is essential. But my, my mind goes to policy. And uh, when I um, discovered uh, Citizens Climate Lobby, I loved the focus. Uh, on policy that involves everyone in the transition from an extractive fossil fuel economy to a clean energy economy. So Citizens Climate Lobby, or I call CCL, provides training. It's a, a, an abundance of training for writers, speakers, not that I'm such a great, well-trained speaker, but uh, schedulers and other jobs. Uh, we experience personal and political power when we work together, influencing the elected to act uh, for, for a stable climate. And it's really thrilling when we can see it working. So uh, some say uh, we're headed for a catastrophe. Uh, I like to side with those who look on the bright side. Um, Paul Hawken is one of those. Paul asked, uh, and I'm gonna look up, so. I'm going to another slide pretty quick here, aren't I? Uh, asked a group of scientists if atmospheric CO2 could be restored to 350 parts per million in time. Recall Dr. Clay's slides showing that we're at uh, 410. They said yes. There are 100 existing solutions that show global potential for uh, restoring the atmosphere to 350 parts per million by 2050. And these findings are called Project Drawdown. And the, the slide shows the cover of the book, and the subtitle is The Most Comprehensive Plan Ever Proposed to Reverse Global Warming. And you can learn more at drawdown.org. And listed here are just se seven of the top 100 solutions. L look at the most powerful of all is refrigerant management. It refers back to Dr. Clay's slide about the HFCs, and, uh, and the take home there is that we not just throw away air conditioners and refrigerators, we make sure that, that, that those gases are captured. Um, then wind turbines reducing food waste, a plant-based diet, tropical forests, educating girls, 
and access to family planning. That's just the top seven. So it's an amazing list. And it's a window on future jobs for you students. I think it's, uh, it gives ideas for policies for climate action plans. It, it, it gives ideas for personal action. And it's a good news story overall. Um, if, and we explore these ideas at our 350 meetings. If you aren't on that mailing list, you can email vcclimatehub at gmail.com and get notices about those meetings. So we must urgently reverse greenhouse gas emissions. On this graph, the top line is the current uh, sad upward trend. The declining red line is Obama's clean power plan, and the gold line dipping by 90% in the over 12 years shows what the economy-wide impact of the policy carbon fee and dividend can do to reduce emissions. This policy operates at the federal level to drive all solutions faster by internalizing the external costs of atmospheric pollution. The result is better choices for consumers. It also includes a global price signal by requiring trading partners to have a similar price on carbon. Carbon fee and dividend will reduce U.S. CO2 equivalent emissions to 10% of 1990 emissions to keep the planet from warming more than two degrees. A more responsible goal, because we know two degrees is really too warm, um, requires diverse multi-layered strategies. No one strategy is going to make it. And that's why I love Drawdown, because there's a hundred and more um, that don't even involve the price on carbon. So. Uh, for example, layering drawdown solutions with a steadily rising price on carbon, we could reach the 350 parts per million sooner than 2050. This is something to work for. And note, that work is not over when we accelerate drawdown solutions and get a price on carbon. We also urgently need a cap on methane and other, the other greenhouse gases, the other short-lived climate pollutants. And we also will soon have goals to sequester the legacy carbon in the atmosphere that's accumulated. And this is about promoting healthy soils and uh, regenerative farming and forests. And that requires uh, rain not going to the ocean. It requires better storm management so that rain sinks in close to where it falls and, not, and is not channeled away. We must create the soil carbon sponges around vegetation to mitigate heat islands and other effects of the drought. The drought is our challenge in this county. So back to the members of Congress, no, they know a federal price on carbon is inevitable. It, when we go to Washington, D.C. And, and talk, it, it's all very, very clear. It's just the response to this knowledge. The political parties di diverge about how to spend that potential trillions of dollars. And you can imagine, uh, liberal Democrats tend to want to invest in programs and pay down the debt is another one of their ideas. Economic conservative Republicans want to shrink government and create revenue neutral policies that stimulate the economy. A bipartisan solution is possible. It's politically feasible. And it will do the job of reducing emissions without growing government. Carbon fee and dividend is the least regressive mechanism that cushions low-income households against the rising price of items that depend on fossil fuels. It's effective and fair, nonpartisan, and harmonizes with every other uh, climate action. So CCL's nonpartisan lobby work paid off big time last year with the Bipartisan Climate Solutions Caucus in the U.S. House of Representatives. It requires equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans. They can only enter two by two, and there are now 36 of each. Yay! <laughs> these, these lawmakers know we urgently need all hands on deck. And they're really seriously talking about it. So I just love this painting so much by the Ashinabi artist Roy Thomas. 
uh, called We're All in the Same Boat. To me, it represents a spirit of unified, creative uh, uh, action. Those are little paint brushes that, that they're all um, wielding there. It inspires me to make space for people who think differently than I do um, about working together to assure justice for future generations. And just in closing, I just love CCL so much because it's a supportive community learning how to move the climate issue forward. And you can simply text join at 619-675-7507 or join at citizensclimatelobby.org. Thanks a lot. down? It kind of went by really fast. All right, next up. Oh, good. Okay, there is information. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, Tomas Morales Rebecki. I don't know if I said that right. Sorry. Uh, he's a senior Central Coast organizer for, for the Food and Water Watch uh, based in Oxnard, Ventura. Um, in an effort to protect our access to safe water and clean drinking water, he's we must halt climate change. Towards this effort, Tomas is working to change the way we produce energy, moving decisively towards a sustainable, renewable energy future. He graduated from San Diego State University with a bachelor's degree in political science and Spanish and was the recipient of the 2017 Earth Charter Award for Ecological Integrity. Tomas. Awesome. I'm very honored to be here with, with all these great speakers. I've learned a lot, and a lot of these other groups and organizations we work with on the ground here in Ventura County. So I want to talk a little bit about Food and Water Watch and specifically about our work to move off of fossil fuels and onto the clean energy revolution. We do a lot of work at Food and Water Watch to ensure clean food and clean water for all, to stand up to corporations that put profits before people and fight for a democracy that truly represents its people and protects our environment. So we have a lot of work on our table from protecting, privatizing water to fighting against uh, factory farms and to fighting fracking. So today I'm gonna to talk mostly about our fights against fracking locally, nationally, and also uh, Food and Water Action, which is another organization, which is our lobbying arm of Food and Water Watch. And I'll describe that a little more too. We launched that last year to help us elect climate leaders that will help us get to where we need to be and take the bold actions that we need to get there. So uh, first I want to talk about the movement to ban fracking. Ten years ago, Food and Water Watch, we were one of the first national organizations to come out and call for a complete ban on fracking. A lot of organizations, Sierra Club and other big greens, they felt we could regulate it. We felt the safest way to uh, keep fracking from polluting our air, water, and causing earthquakes is to keep it in the ground and ban it. There is no safe fracking. So we told that, we took that bold step 10 years ago. And we've been working in communities from New York to California to pass resolutions, pass local bans to stop fracking it and stop pollution because as uh, Dr. Omar Clay was talking about, methane is actually a worse greenhouse gas than CO2. And when you add up a lot of the leaking from the pipes, from the drilling, to the power plants, actually some studies are showing that it's actually worse than coal. So this was sold to us as a bridge fuel. We're going to frack our way to the clean energy revolution, but that was a total lie and we're finding that out more and more now. So Food and Water Watch, we've worked, worked to ban uh, fracking in New York, uh, Vermont, and also many communities here in California. And that's actually how I met Food and Water Watch uh, four years ago in a small county, San Benito, uh, four hours north of here. We had never heard of fracking, never heard of cyclic steam injection at all until an oil company wanted to drill a thousand new cyclic steam in fracking wells. Cyclic steam is exactly what Kim was talking about, using high amounts of steam to get really tight, dirty, dirty oil out of the ground. So we're only a, a community of 50,000 in our whole county. There's only 20,000 registered voters. So we, we took the direct democracy into our own hand. Here in California, we can pass ordinances at the county county level to ban fracking. So we qualified an initiative to ban fracking and stop that project. And little did we know the oil industry was not very happy with that. And they threw everything they had at us. They 
outspent us 15 to 1 in a county with only 20,000 registered voters and spent $2 million. And so by the end of the campaign, we had knocked on door to door. We, didn't, we couldn't beat them dollar for dollar, but we could beat them going door to door, getting volunteers, activating the grassroots network. So we won that fight with a 60 to 40 percent win. <laughs> And I've been honored to work with Food and Water Watch ever since they hired me on as the full-time Central Coast organizer for the organization. And most recently, the movement to ban fracking has spread throughout California. Over eight other counties have banned fracking. The significant oil-producing counties that have banned it was just recently, in 2016, Monterey County, the fourth largest oil-producing county here in California. Actually, a lot of people in Monterey didn't realize how much oil is pre being produced there. A lot of people in California don't realize how much oil is being produced here. We're actually the third largest oil, oil producer out of all the other states behind Texas and North Dakota. So we have a really bad problem. We talk a good talk on the level from Jerry Brown all the way down to our local elected officials, but we're not backing it up with good actions, like keeping it in the ground, moving us to 100% renewables on a time frame that's going to keep us under the climate chaos models. So. In Monterey County, this was actually a bigger fight because the oil industry had more to lose. They had an established industry. They doubled down and spent uh, over $6 million. They outspent us 30 to 1 this time. But still, using the same tactics of going door to door, activating grassroots networks, working with other local organizations, we were able to win that fight too, 56%. We still sent a clear message that California, we don't want this. We, made, we sent a clear message, we don't want this in our backyards. And uh, what, what, what happened last election too, as many of us know, a horrible thing happened. We have a climate deniers in the White House and we, we are taking a huge step back, even though we had this great victory here in Monterey County, there's been a huge step back at the national level. So Food and Water Watch, we decided that we needed to take bolder action and move into electoral types of organizing and politics that other organizations usually can't do. Does anybody know the difference between a 501c3 and a 501c4? Okay, it's very few people. A lot of the organizations I talked to here today are 501c3, so it limits to what kind of uh, activities you can engage in, from lobbying to interacting with voters uh, and also endorsing candidates, climate champions. So if we have people in the White House, we have people at our local or state level that aren't willing to take the bold action, we're going to vote them out and we're going to put people in there that actually do their jobs. So. so that's why this year we've we launched Off Fossil Fuels, which is a project of food and water action. And we're together, we're moving aggressively to distribute our organizational tools to communities throughout the uh, country and throughout the state that don't have on the ground organizers. Uh, they get uh, access to creating online petitions. We have uh, local resolutions and bans languages so you can take it to your local city councils and, and lobby them to pass uh, local bans. Also candidate pledges to get them to pledge to move to 100% renewable energy by 2035, support a ban on fracking and not take any oil money because here in California too, Chevron, Western States Petroleum, they lobby, they spend the most money at our state capital and it's going up every year. So they know they have a lot to lose. So we, through our grassroots networks, through partner organizations. If you're part of an organization and want to join, please go to offfossilfuels.org. We'll, we have a map with all our other local partner organizations. You can add events. We have uh, texting so you can activate local uh, members to come out to hearings. We've partnered uh, locally with Seafrog on uh, opposing the oil wells throughout Oxnard, and we'll be fighting these oil wells too, uh, the cyclic steam ones. So. Uh, if you want to get involved, uh, please, everybody, pull out your phones. Pull up a new text message. Everyone do this while I'm doing it. <laughs> and text REVOLUTION to 69866. All right, welcome. You guys are all now part of the Clean Energy Revolution. <laughs> You'll get text updates anytime. There's people in our area and events. So uh, I've skipped over a lot of stuff, so please check our website and our Facebooks too. Thank you all for your time.
Moss, do you have a table out there as well? Yes, we have. And table. you have information on the table? Okay, great, thank you. All right, our last speaker, um, Kitty Merrill. She's co-founder of 350 Ventura County Climate Hub. 350.org is a grassroots network that proposes that while climate change has advanced, it can be reversed. It extends to 188 countries. Ms. Merrill has brought our community together to inform, encourage, and participate in building a more sustainable future for ourselves and our children. She was VC Reporter's 2016 Local Hero, and she's also chair of the um, Environmental Action Team of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Ventura. You have heard from a ton of people. I never imagined I was going to be one of the people, passionate people at the front, standing up and telling you about things. Way back when, when I saw an inconvenient truth, marched home, made some changes in my life. I walked more, drove less, turned off the furnace and bundled up, bought recycled printer paper and printed on both sides. I pretty much figured I had it handled. Then, 2012, I saw a movie called Do the Math, and it made me realize we can't solve climate change on an individual basis. One person at a time just doesn't cut it. We had to take what we knew about climate change and turn it into change and action in the world. So a group of us came together and formed a Ventura County chapter of 350.org. So as Professor Patty was saying, it's a global coalition of people working together, trying to save the planet. Well, actually strike that, trying to save the planet as a pay place where people can live by trying to get carbon levels down to 350 parts per billion, million. There are a lot of ways to do that work. So in 350, folks that like marching, march. Some write letters to the editor or speak at government meetings. Others work to raise awareness of the science behind climate change. Still others learn and share individual ways to ha that can have big results. It's more important to do something, and to do it so your action reaches others. And that applies to every category of individual change. So the principles of 350, we've got different visions of what to do and how to do it, but we all work with the cre those key principles, keeping carbon in the ground, helping to build a low carbon economy, and pressuring governments into limiting emissions. So keeping carbon in the ground, what does that mean? It can mean, come a lot of different ways. You could buy a reusable mug when you get coffee, choose to buy things with less packaging. When something's reused, we're not gonna have to burn fossil fuels to make a new one. Just becoming aware of this is huge. It's so normal to get new things. Buy fast fashion, wear it a few times, eh, it falls apart, that's okay, it was cheap. A new phone comes out. Oh, you gotta get the new gadget. Out goes the old. Go out to eat. Well, leave the leftovers. You don't really want them. It all affects the environment. Eating carbon footprints, what do we eat? Just changing from a meat-heavy diet to a no-beef diet. You're cutting, cutting your carbon footprint way down. And you can always, there's always the next step to go but one step at a time. Food waste is huge, and deforestation is also a part of production of beef, soy, palm oil, wood products, all of these wind up knocking down the rainforests, and suddenly you've got that whole underworld of carbon that was sequestered that isn't sequestered anymore and becomes a huge problem. So. What you need to do, start making changes in your diet, and then once you've made that amazing plant-based, palm oil-free meal, invite your friends over to share leftovers and Instagram the whole thing. Expand your influence even further. So food waste, keep those leftovers coming, buy the bumpy pear, get the banana that looks a little bit weird, but it's gonna taste perfectly great. We need to keep the carbon in the ground and that means food waste as well. So we are working for a new 
more equitable, low-carbon economy. You've heard about ways to work toward this. Councilman, we Councilmember Weir talked about community choice energy, Seafrog and Food and Water Watch and Citizens Climate Lobby all have wonderful ways that we can work toward this. As an individual, when you hear about a plan for a new power plant or oil wells coming to your neighborhood, write a letter to the editor or the city council. Tell them you want power from renewable energy sources. Then ask your friends and family to join you. It really can work. Oxnard Coll or, um, 350 Ventura County is proud to have partnered with many local groups to prevent the Puente Power Plant from being built in Oxnard. <laughs> Divestment is another big one. That means taking your money away from companies that are doing things that harm the earth. You may not think of yourself as a big investor, but if you have a bank account, you're making money for the place that keeps your money. It's a choice of what do you want to invest in, sea level rise, dirty air and water, wildfires in December, or into your values. Instead of a big bank, you can decide to put your money into a local credit union. Or look for the petition in the lobby tonight asking for support for SB 964, requiring CalPERS and CalSTRS to divest their pension funds from fossil fuels. Also, consider making investing in microloans. Kiva.org is a great one. To, to giving money to people in developing countries to help the, give them access to clean power, for women's education, and more. There are, there are many ways to take part. Take your climate change knowledge that you've gotten tonight, share it using your interests and your talents. If you're an artist, expand your work's reach from a single artwork to creating posters and memes. That's a multiplier. The same with the written word. Instead of just writing an essay for English class, make the essay about something you care about. Send it along to the VC star and the reporter as a guest column. Or write to your representatives. Letters get read. They make a difference. You have influence. And that's what you can all be now, influencers. It's essential to the struggle for our planet. More than you imagine, it comes down to individuals. Politicians don't create change. Their political will comes from their constituents, from those they hear from anyway. Make sure you're one of them. Businesses aren't going to change their ways on their own. They run on a profit motive, not ethics. If something makes money, that's good, right? Unless you motivate them to change their minds by not buying a product and making it a little less profitable. Even though your behavior is that of just one person, when combined with others, it becomes more powerful. Small actions can guide society into a different way of being. No matter where you are on this path, it matters. You have a stake in our planet. Act to support it. Don't let yourself get overwhelmed. Do the things you can do. Don't let the ones you can't do be an excuse. If you want to move to a plant-based diet, but you absolutely cannot give up bacon, <laughs> then start by being a bacon-eating vegetarian. <laughs> the planet will thank you. Okay, so what we're going to do is um, I would like whoever wants to ask a question to stand up and ask the question and direct it to one of our panelists. And I'm going to ask the panelists to repeat the question so it could be recorded properly. All right, sound good? Go ahead, stand up. If you need to, let's do that. I don't, I will, we'll be running all the way. All right. uh, this question is for um, the scientists, Mr. Omar, yeah. um, I saw a documentary um, about uh, deforestation in Brazil, how they're uh, making herds and everything, uh, they're herding cows and all that. Um, and so my question, I, I saw on your, on your uh, graphs, 38% is um, on fossil fuels and 35% is on livestock. 
But according to, I don't know, according to that uh, documentary that I saw uh, on raising cows, it's called Cowspiracy on Netflix. Um, what do you call it? Uh, that, the raising of cows, all the methane that's produced is actually more impactful or impact on the environment than like car emissions, you know, according to that documentary. Uh, but according to your uh, graph, you had fossil fuel more than the cow herding. I don't know. Um, can you talk about that, please? Thank you. Thank you. So that's a great question. Uh, the question is that um, a lot of uh, the beef industry internationally is actually involved in deforestation. And he saw in the, in the presentation that I made that the, the estimates that I was indicating were that the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are, are more uh, more intense from carbon emit or more intense from fossil f fuel combustion than it is from from uh, beef. I, I'll say this about uh, that. One, I, I can't speak directly to the to sti to sti the statistics in the documentary you watched, but um, when I delved into the actual details of what car uh, which greenhouse gases and where they were coming from, uh, I was basing that on EPA statistics that are specific to the United States. And so when we talk about an international community, uh, it, it's a bit different. Um, the deforestation in Brazil and elsewhere, I mean, we are trying to catalog it with satellite imagery and such, but some of these things can be very difficult to quantify. So with everything I showed you, this, this is the best that we know of, the best that I know of, as far as the science, uh, but um, sometimes we get it wrong, you know? So it is possible that um, the, the beef industry internationally due to the fact that it's deforesting, it has a lot larger impact than what we saw within the United States. However, uh, it's very difficult for me to imagine that the gigatons of carbon dioxide that we're producing on an annual basis is actually going to be in any way actually dwarfed by the beef industry specifically. Again, I could be wrong on that, but th that's my understanding. Here, question. How can we have the greatest impact in terms of changing policy here in Ventura County or Ventura City. Because again, elections are coming up, and I think we really need to think policy impact. And it's kind of to the panel as a whole. Do we want to take that? Well, I have a question. Um, who here would be in favor of banning disposable straws? Okay, because that, that might be coming up <laughs> um, <clears throat> for our city council. Um, we're also voting on, on a position about um, oil drilling offshore. Um, in two weeks, I believe that's coming to us. So, um, anytime something like that comes to our our city council agenda, we welcome you to come give us comments or email. And I think you might want to talk about the board of supervisors. Well, so yeah, just making sure that your elected officials and potential candidates know what's important to you. So, if if you think that your elected officials should be creating policy and supporting policy that would reduce contributions to climate change, let them know that and support those candidates. And I have a couple examples from you because I can talk to my supervisors okay. so I don't have all the content info. Okay, so right now with the general plan update, you can let your supervisor know that you support strong climate action being incorporated into all land use policy in the county. And I, so that's one example, is that helpful? Or, I'd, I'd like more. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so specific in land use policy or an additional example? So, I'm, I'm, I'm an older person. In fact, 30, 40 years, I remember there was a push to have all restaurants not use ice because that the energy that's required is not healthy for you. But then that's kind of disappeared. Here throughout the county, is that something that we should be pushed on with the straws? We're going we're to have to be elected board of supervisor. One part of the city, our, another supervisor will be retiring. So it's important that we actually have some more specifics so we can kind of find the right piece of people to elect. Do you want to speak? I mean, I was going to say, too, because you're talking about a wide range of issues. So, right, for Seafrog and the lens that I'm speaking through is related to oil and gas. So if you think that oil and gas expansion should be restricted in the county, that's something, you know, because that could have an impact on climate change, 
to, you can speak directly about that. And the other thing I would speak to is you don't need to be an expert on an issue, right? Sometimes I think all of us think we have to have the data that the scientists have in order to support. And so if there's just an issue that's important to you, and I bet Councilmember Ware can speak to this, just hearing from a constituent saying, this is important to me, you should do something to reduce our impacts to climate change like restrict oil and gas expansion in the Oxnard Plain because if you take out those, you know, all that tar sands, when it gets burned, it's going to create more carbon in the atmosphere. Something like that. Thank you. The largest sector of emissions in the county is from transportation. It's over half. And our county transportation commission hasn't really embraced this problem. There are experts who think that um, we need to reduce the use of cars by 32% in order to achieve the state mandated goals, which are not even adequate goals to reverse the problem. So, uh, and think, I mean, that's huge. So any, there, there are, um, if you, uh, part of the last round of input into the Ventura County General Plan uh, 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 the Climate Hub put together, I didn't even count how many pages, it might be 25 pages of ideas, and you can find them at world.350.org forward slash Ventura. The last four posts are ideas like what you're asking for. One whole section is on emissions reduction, and about half of that is on transportation. It includes parking policies. It includes um, electrification of, of the transit system. The, another whole s section is on carbon sequestration because that also has to happen. Just in re reducing emissions isn't going to save a livable planet. We have to pull out that legacy carbon that we've put up there. The third section is called resilience, and that include, and then there's a fourth called environmental justice. So you, there's a there's a, a big smorgasbord of ideas uh, on on the website, and there's a place to comment, to add more, and ask questions. especially for our council women here, why we continue, we are in a drought. It's not going to change. Why are we continuing to give building permits for new construction in this area? This is also a county issue. Why are we continuing when we have a drought that is so severe? As you know, <laughs> I have voted no um, on a lot of the new development that is being proposed. And the number one issue is our water supply. Um, what you can do, we have in the upcoming November election, the city of Ventura is now divided into seven uh, election districts. So it'll be a whole new way of voting. You won't vote for a council member for the whole city. And there are four districts up for election. So. The west side, uh, the east side north of the 126, the east side south of the 126, and the Montalvo area up to the government center. Those are the four districts that you will be able to elect new council members. So those four um, will probably be new council members. And so they will have a lot of influence on decisions about development. So I would suggest that you get involved in your district, wherever you live, with your community council, and get involved in the upcoming election and make sure that your candidate who you're supporting um, reflects your values, whether it be um, helping us with environmental issues or helping us make decisions about development and water supply versus water demand. Another one of the chapters I think is posted, if it's not, I'll post it tonight, is on the water chapter of the Ventura County General Plan. And you'll see in there, it's possible to have 
uh, building policies for very close to net zero water. There are, are, are ways of writing codes that can allow for uh, construction, and we really do need low-income housing desperately. And, and what we need is that, that when, when those projects are approved, that, that, they, that they be built according to technology that uses a minimum amount of water. I saw you the gentleman stand up earlier. Do you want the microphone? Um, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Capitalism is the reason why we're at the point. Where, what was that? Oh, is why we're where we're at. It's an industry that's going to keep extracting profits no matter what the consequences are to the people around it. So that's why we need to be looking off of other models. And actually, we're going to need a lot of support from the government to get the industry. It's already booming, but we're going to need a lot more support, like a World War II type of mobilization to create the infrastructure, the storage, and all that. So yeah, it's not going to be a pure capitalist model, but the United States of America is not a pure capitalist model. And if we keep following the markets and letting that solve our problems, it's going to get us into any more trouble because it's not going to end. It's until they got every last dime, every last drop of oil, and nobody else can breathe and nobody else can drink water. So we got to look for other methods. Well, and quickly to piggyback on that, so as an organization that finally, that frequently finds themselves up against um, the oil and gas industry, we do hear the jobs, jobs, jobs mantra over and over again. And the fact is, is that the renewable sector creates many more new jobs, long lasting, well paying, clean jobs than the oil and gas industry does, including oil and gas expansion. So I like to use the example of um, an expansion that happened in the upper Ojai Valley. And before I was with Seafrog, I was a freelance reporter in the county covering oil and gas. And I asked that oil operator, so when you are able to drill these five or six new wells, how many workers are you going to hire? And he said, none. The drilling companies come from Bakersfield. They drill the well, and then they leave, and the existing oil field workers manage those existing wells. So if we are limiting expansion, we are not preventing new jobs, number one. And by creating policies that bring in renewable and promote renewable energy and other technologies, so part of land use development can be about promoting all different kinds of technologies from bioplastics to biofuels to things I don't even know about in the county that foster all different kinds of jobs. So there's lots of ways to create the income, the increased income. I love that comment about higher income rather than affordable housing, um, than expanding dirty energy sources. Real quick, one, one example of the um capitalism versus environment. Um, recently, the state of California and lots of cities had discussions about disposable bags, plastic bags. And when we as a city council were discussing um, banning plastic bags here at grocery stores, um, the argument was that the bag manufacturers would go out of business and that would be loss of jobs. And I just sat up there honestly scratching my head going, they'll adapt <laughs> um, new, new you know jobs adapt capitalism adapts you just have to do what's right for the environment long term and the jobs will adapt there will be new jobs that are more sustainable and so our decisions and and it helps to have the public 
um, there to back up our decisions to counteract because you have a lot of people in the audience at a city council or supervisors meeting saying, you know, what about the jobs? So we, we need your help. Actually, I wanted to weigh in on that also. Um, you know, f first of all, when it comes to capitalism, um, the fossil fuel industry has been distorting markets for a very long time. There's a tremendous number of subsidies in our, in our federal policies that really promote these industries and have allowed them to have more power than they should. You know, I mean, some of the cleanups, uh, you know, Exxon Valdez or the Deepwater Horizon explosion in, in the Gulf, th these are tax write-offs for, for these corporations, unbelievably. Um, so, so there's that issue, and then the other issue I want to point out is that had, for instance, Exxon and Shell actually responded appropriately when their scientists first informed them in the late 70s and the early 80s about the implications of hydrocarbon combustion, um, we would have half of the carbon dioxide emissions in the atmosphere that we have today. So the linkage between the way capitalism is uh, functioning in our country today and climate change is tremendous. It's, 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 it's really an overwhelming factor. And it's obviously something that has to be addressed. And it, it is, to some extent, being addressed. As I mentioned, uh, you know, we have a number of state attorney generals are now investigating Exxon and Shell for, for their role in misinforming the public about the implications of uh, hydrocarbon combustion. And uh, we have a whole bunch of communities. He's, here are coastal communities in California, Marin, um, uh, La Jolla, I think, uh, Imperial Beach. A, a variety of communities are now in lawsuits. Uh, regarding the way that these fossil fuel industries have treated our common resource, our atmosphere. So this is a major issue, and it's one that people really are going to have to mobilize uh, against on, on a whole bunch of issues, uh, a whole bunch of levels. Uh, this is a question for the doctor, but I just wanted to say one thing about um, the housing. You know, one of the repercussions of not dealing with the housing crisis is that people have longer and longer commutes. And anyways, um, I have a question for you, doctor. Um, I read an article about eight or ten years ago, and I cannot find it. Uh, I thought it was a National Geographic, but... They were, I, I thought it was a, a great argument against the people that say, well, we've had all these global warnings before, it's no big deal. And um, they said uh, there was a, a, a discrepancy over time in the increase in temperatures and the uh, increase in gases, where once the, uh, I can never say it right, I call it the Malkovich cycle. Um, <laughs> once that kicks in, the temperature would rise for between 600 and 1,000 years before there was any sign of uh, increased greenhouse gases. And, uh, you know, it's coming from data in the ice sheets and the sediment layers. And I just want to know, can you corroborate that? Because I go around telling that to people, and now I can't find my source on that. Uh, so, so the question is, is regarding our, our paleoclimate record, and, and what I didn't show you, we have a very rich and very long historical record of climate on our planet. You know, we've been able to piece together the atmospheric concentration of various gases for, I think now it's, it's well over a million years, certainly the last 800,000 years. And, and incidentally, uh, in that time, CO2 levels have never risen to the level they are today in the last million years. So we're in a different regime than what we've seen in the past. So that's one issue. The other issue is that um, we're, we're trying to infer historical temperatures based on uh, uh, oxygen isotope ratios. And it's, it's a bit of a tricky business. So, th so that paleoclimate science is always evolving. But it is true that if you just look at the graphs, it looks like the uh, oxygen isotope ratios rise first, and then you get greenhouse gas emissions. But as you mentioned, there was a whole variety of other things going on in the climate cycle. The Milankovitch cycles in particular do line up with a lot of 
previous climate history. Today, we're in a different era, though. When we look at these natural cycles, these are not what's driving global warming today. So it's, a, it's just a different phenomenon. It's a little bit like comparing apples and oranges. It's a little bit not, because we don't fully understand all the feedback mechanisms. And as I mentioned, the feedback mechanisms are a current research frontier. And we may see that some of the, like I was mentioning, the melting permafrost. As the climate warms, then you get these feedbacks that may cause further warming. And so that's where those greenhouse gases may actually lag temperature increases in some of the paleoclimate records. Is, is there, there proof that it, um, salt proof that it's been a, a window of like 600 or 1,000 years of temperature increase before the greenhouse gases started increasing? No, uh, I, not, not that long. Uh, I think, it, it, first of all, it really depends when you, when you look at the records you know, you'd have to be talking about a particular warming event for, for, for anybody to address that appropriately. Um, but uh, no, that, that's a, that time scale is, is, is far, far off. Uh, the time scale would may, maybe be in a 10,000 years tops and probably less than that. And, th and that's the other thing actually I should say about our current warming epoch is this is occurring on a time scale that we haven't seen before. This is really abrupt. We have contracts with Harrison for our um, trash service, and, and we can lobby them to do that. And we can look at local, um, what the restaurants are tricky, and, and you're talking about food waste in, from restaurants. Okay, residential and restaurants. Um, because the county regulates the restaurants, um, and the city regulates obviously our households. Um, but we have asked them, they're, Harris and I have to tell you, and Agrimin are leaders in the industry. They have um, done recycling, and they're, they're starting to look at styrofoam and all kinds of things that um, no other communities do. And we have talked to them about food waste. Um, so it's, it's, a dis and it's an ongoing discussion, and um, I would say stay tuned to that. But we are definitely in discussions with them about that. I'm going to try and keep this concise. I'm not good at that. Um, so I was really interested. I mean, the fact that we're an agricultural county, and there's a lot of talk about a plant-based diet, and you know, your your comment at the end about you know if you really can't give up bacon, you know, then be a vegan and eat bacon. The fact the fact that we have companies like Watkins Beef that produces really really good bacon locally, regeneratively, they're actively putting and measuring carbon back into the soil. Um, places like McGrath, you know, organic farms, we've got Underwood family farms, and I didn't hear any of those mentioned. Jan, you touched on like regenerative agriculture, you know, and we, we both have crazy systems. I mean, we have like, you know, we basically produce most of our food off of our urban lot in Camarillo. You know, we're harvesting 4,100 4, gallons of water off of our roof um, easily within like a two inch rainfall. We're full, and then we're put, we, I think we calculate another. 25,000 gallons we put back into the soil just on our yard. So I didn't hear any talk about that. I mean, I see pictures of like 50 gallon rain barrels that, you know, and it's not just this county, but that, that these nice solutions get pushed, but we don't really look in our backyards and see what our farmers are already doing here and how we can really support them. And we have a great farmer's market. I pick up anywhere from 80 to 150 um, pounds of food waste every week from the Camarillo Farmer's Market. That's just beet tops and stuff. We feed it to our animals. We turn out great soil. So all of these things are things that everybody can do, and we're not talking about them. And I wish I wish I had seen I had seen more of that. You know, we talk about like Brazilian Brazilian beef, but we don't talk about the fact that we can order um, incredibly regeneratively grown beef right from our backyards. You can order it from Marietta through Primal Pastures. Crowd Cow um, is another source. So. I'd like to see more of that in this conversation of like what is actually already going on in terms of that. So, I don't, I, this, there's not really a question there. I'm, well, I am kind of curious why we're pushing, you know, an abstract concept of a plant-based diet when we have an agricultural county that has so many opportunities to develop a regenerative agriculture right here. We have a small city called Los Angeles right next door that we could be feeding when we're shipping like 90% of our produce right out of the county. So. 
Yeah, sure. In Step my in. presentation, I mentioned that there's a coalition of organizations that are participating in a general plan update, which includes policy around agriculture. And so some, um, there's the Center for Regenerative Agriculture, which is participating in that. And I would just say there needs to be more voices. So if that's something that's in, that you're interested in, I can give you my contact info to help you connect with that. And, and you know, it's one of those things we need the groundswell, the, the voices to add to that so that I, just like in every industry, the county is hearing from the large corporate ag right now, right? It's a major industry driver in this county and it needs to hear more about the folks that are re doing regenerative ag and that that can be part of the pathway forward. So that's it. I'm not sure why that didn't come up tonight. That's what I, I was curious about. Was mm -hmm. like, you know, you can make a, a blanket statement about, you know, bacon or veganism or whatever, and nobody said like, we have these incredible resources right here. So just that, yeah. So, but that, that's, that's another great resource. I think a lot of it is just the time limit that we sure. were under. I think that you know what you're talking about is absolutely right. And yes, in my household. Not everybody's a vegetarian, and for the big holidays, yes, we're going to trot out and find a really happy animal, and we will enjoy that animal and celebrate it <laughs> when we eat it. Watkins is a good place for that. I just want to follow up on that, and, and, and I didn't mention uh, local board, but the local board movement is really a, a significant way of, of changing your diet, and, 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 and you know, relying on local um, farmers markets and such is, is a great way to reduce the amount of carbon involved in the food that ends up in your plate so you know it's, i think it's a good point but i agree that we just didn't uh, have have the time I can talk about the city, <laughs> um, being on the city council. Um, we, we have lots of um, information at the city for people that want to do gray water systems. I don't know if you're talking about that or not. Um, but gray water systems where they use their water instead of it going out into the sewer. And um, we're, when we, you know we are doing a rebuild of 500 houses in the hillsides that burned. And what we're trying to do when we are uh, approving permits for all those new houses is highly encouraged and put them at the front of the line um, if they do, uh, you know, like ocean friendly gardens, um, any way of keeping their water on their property, um, whether it be gray water or rainwater or any, any of that. We are highly encouraging. We can't force people to do that, um, but we can make it very simple and um, we can give them rebates and so forth for that sort of thing. So we are highly encouraging that. So you're going to hear me just say it, Ventura County General Plan update. They're writing land use policy regarding water management that will lead to um, building ordinances for what you're talking about. So. The uh, uh, California Resources Board has a page on carbon sequestration, um, and they, um, if you dig a little bit down in there, uh, they have collaborated with the Department of Conservation and the Nature Conservancy uh, testing a, um, a tool for determining the carbon sequestration capacity or the carbon sinks of every county uh, and using LIDAR technology and being able to evaluate the vegetation of every county. Uh, it's being tested right now in Merced County and uh, I, I have an offer of the developers to bring it here to present it. And uh, I believe that um, this, is, th this to me is a huge thing to ask the county 
to incorporate into the general plan is that we set, we, we do get our baseline with the state of the art technology, and then we set goals for uh, sequestering carbon suit, suitable for each uh, specific, you know, land, land use and cropping system. And what we'll find then is the need uh, for water, because you cannot sequester carbon without the water. And so I really appreciate the question about the restoration of small water cycles and every bit of thinking has got to be turned upside down about how we manage water on the land. It's, yeah, it didn't, it didn't get enough play tonight, I agree. <laughs> we also have a really good local organization in Surfrider and they've worked creating uh, guidelines for ocean-friendly gardens. And that's something that you can look at as an individual if you're considering redoing your yard. You know, when we ripped out our lawn, I dug a nice depression in it. It's called a swale and filled it up with pebbles. So when the rain comes, we get a pond for about 10 minutes, but it sinks into the ground instead of going out to the street. And there are a lot of those kinds of things that you can look into on an individual basis. Fortunately, the state has a requirement for all new development in the whole state of California that they retain their stormwater on site. Mm -hmm. And so any new development that is built, um, we're talking, you know, like a housing tract or, or apartment or whatever. Um, in fact, you'll see some of our new housing developments being built um, with, there will be bioswales, there'll be permeable paving, there'll be all, all of that is actually required that no stormwater come off that new project down the streets into the oceans. So that's a state requirement. It's the city's job and the county's job to enforce that requirement and make sure it happens. Um, but for, that's, a, that's a great state. I mean, it, there was a lot of people complained about that at first because it's expensive for developers. But um, on the long term, we've, we've got a great new parking lot downtown um, off of Santa Clara Street that is a really good example of beautiful, uh, landscaping, all sorts of bioswale areas, permeable pavers, um, that's the future, honestly, that's, and that's what we're gonna do more of. 
And what was the other part of your question? Um, well, the city educates people through our website and through our permitting process. When we, when we, when anybody comes and wants a building permit, we give them this checklist of here's all the green, um, here's the, here's all the green things you can do. Here's all the green things you must do, <laughs> and then here's all the green things you can do if if you want to. Because I find it, I find it, well, I'm a solar consultant, and so I, I have to deal with this on a daily mm -hmm. basis, and not only adoption but also actually passing laws that make financial sense for people. But I've noticed that you know, like in the Oxnard River Park. Um, they say they're solar ready, you know, but, you know, permitting wise maybe, but the entire design is very inefficient for solar. South facing planes aren't open, things like that. So I'm wondering if there's, it's not just going to be like in name, like, oh, you can have a conduit inside your wall, but if we're actually going to start to make gray water and solar and, and all these, you know, all these not really technologies, but kind of uh, technologies, not just in name, easy to adopt, but that it's built into the permitting process where it's actually really intelligently adopted, where the design starts yeah. to mimic the natural landscape and where the sun is and where the water is flowing. Like passive solar and all that. Yeah, the checklist at the beginning, before you, before you talk to your architect, you need to go through the checklist to figure out what you want to do and then design to that. Well, and I would even say, so for the general plan, how you kind of started your question and even what Christy was talking about. So there's what's required and then if there are things that a particular industry like the solar industry knows that maybe goes beyond compliance but that would be really beneficial and maybe it's going to be mandated in 20, 30, 40, 50 years, I would even say the solar industry can start lobbying. Like we, you know, there's lots of industries that have really powerful lobbies right <laughs> and so you you know that industry can come and lobby to during the ventura county general plan update and say okay here are your state mandates you got to have the permeable hardscapes yada 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 but guess what if you design buildings in this way you will even exceed you know the the mandates and and be better prepared to move into the future and so forth so i think that it's important for the county to hear that Good, we've gone over.